Hello, and welcome to the State of 911 webinar series hosted by the National 911 Program. My name is Sherry, and I will be the moderator for today's session. This webinar series is designed to provide useful information for the 911 stakeholder community about how nationwide 911 data and strategic plans can improve emergency communications at the state and local levels. It includes real experiences from leaders utilizing these processes throughout the country. Today's session will feature presenters from the National Governors Association and the National Association of State 911 Administrators. Mr. Michael Garcia, Policy Analyst of the Homeland Security and Public Safety Division, National Governors Association's Center for Best Practices, and Gordon Coles, Utah Statewide Interoperability Coordinator, will share their experiences and lessons learned from the Policy Academy. Ms. Ev Bailey, Executive Director of the National Association of State 911 Administrators, and Ms. Randy Jones, 911 Coordinator for the State of Arkansas, will discuss how to use the data from the 2016 National 911 Progress Report. For more information on future National 911 program webinars or to access archived recordings or learn more about the National 911 program, please visit 911.gov. Feedback or questions about the webinars can be sent to national 911 team at mcp911.com. If you are experiencing difficulty with the WebEx application, please call WebEx Technical Assistance at 1-866-229-3239 and select option one. Please note that all participants' phone lines have been put in a listen-only mode and this webinar is being recorded. To ask questions of our presenters, feel free to take one of two actions. Using the WebEx chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen, enter your question at any time during the presentation and it will be entered into a queue. This feature is not visible while your screen is in the expanded page view. Or to ask your question live, use the raise hand feature to request your phone line be unmuted and you will be called upon to ask your question. With that, I would like to introduce Ms. Lori Flaherty, Coordinator for the National 911 Program. Lori, please go ahead. Thanks so much, Sherry, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, today, whether it's morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speakers today. Uh, uh, and the first set of speakers are Mr. Michael Garcia and Mr. Gordon Coles, and I met Michael, when the kickoff meeting uh, was conducted for the Policy Academy um, for the five states that were a part of this project, Alaska, Hawaii, Illinois, Utah, and West Virginia. And I'm really excited to find out um, what happened with the Policy Academy and the experiences that Utah had. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Great. Thank you, Lori. I um, really appreciate that introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Mal Garcia, and as mentioned, I am a policy analyst at the National Government Association. And I've been here now for about two years um, in their Homeland Security and Public Safety Division. And before I talk about our project, I just want to give a brief background of who NGA is for those of you who are unfamiliar with us. So uh, next slide, please. So this is our mission statement, and in brief, we are a nonprofit that assists governors, and we do this through two ways based on how we're organized. Um, on one hand, we have our Office of Government Relations, which is our advocacy entity that advances priorities for the governors to the Hill and administration and federal officials. And on the other side, we have the NGA Center for Best Practices, where I reside. And this is more of a mix between a think tank and a consulting organization where we identify best practices across the state and write original reports on various topics, but we also launch various projects to assist states implement these best practices that we identify. So across the center, um, we focus on a host of issues such as health, education, economic development, homeland security, public safety, and uh, energy and transportation. And within my team, and what I specifically focus on is emergency communications and cybersecurity. 
And within emergency communications, we cover a host of issues such as LAM over radio, 911, NG 911, and broadband and FirstNet. And um, prior to this project, we were very much involved with FirstNet. We have a seat on the, on the PSAC. Um, we're also um, involved with the National Council of Statewide and our coordinators. And we've had some conversation with 911 groups. But um, our real involvement with emergency comms came in the fall of 2016 when we partnered with the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Emergency Communications to launch a project vehicle we call a Policy Academy. Um, next slide, please. And I'm sure many of you have seen this report before. This came out in the fall of 2015, and it was OEC's um, Guide to Improve Governance for Emergency Communications. On the right hand, you see a model of how, what they've seen, um, governance models across the states. And we reached out to OEC and thought there would be a good project um, at hand because we saw that there was a need to elevate the importance of emergency communications, you know, LMR, 911, broadband, to the governor's level and to really portray the message that, you know, you cannot think of this as an IT issue, but it's really a public safety issue and that without these tools and without communicating the, the message of their priorities and, and how to implement them and make them effective, it really hampers the ability for public safety emergency responders to effectively do their job. And so what we saw and what, what we part of DHS is that there's a need to improve these governance bodies such as statewide interoperability executive committees or SICs or statewide interoperability governance bodies or SIGBs for the purpose of coordinating policy decisions around these emergency communication tools. And so our goal through this project vehicle was to identify ways to improve these bodies and think specifically about these issues and think about how we can assist states um, coordinate around these issues and ensure that they are, these conversations are happening together and not separately in silos. Um, next slide, please. So what you see here is a timeline of the activities that um, the Policy Academy um, encompass. And so officially the, the title was a Policy Academy on Enhancing Emergency Communications Interoperability. And so this really started in um, the winter of 2016 where we hosted a round table with various subject matter experts to talk about what are the challenges facing states when it comes to emergency communications and specifically how can we think strategically on a high level to improve coordination um, within these governance bodies. And based off that information, we drafted a request for applications that went out to all 55 state territories and we received um, and it chose five states and then we, we convened them in May, which is um, the meeting that um, Lori mentioned. And during this day and a half meeting, we heard from a, a bunch of state and federal experts about emergency communication in general, but more importantly, we devoted specific facilitation time for each state and sat down with them and said, we have about a little less than a year to think about what you want to accomplish when it comes to improving your governance, but more importantly, improving emergency communication. So what are some concrete steps we can take and what is that going to look like um, by November, and more importantly, by April when this actually all wraps up? So we did that and created a strategic roadmap. And in the summer of uh, 2016, we visited each state to bring together a whole host of stakeholders. And I have to go back and say that each, each state sent a team, a core team of five individuals. So each state sent five people to that May kickoff meeting. And then in their respective states, they, they had more um, individuals come to their meetings. And these meetings range from as few as 20 to as many as 50. And these were diverse stakeholders. And I know Gordy will talk about it, but in Utah, there were several 9-1 administrators in the room. And so this was really a whole state approach. And we wanted, we pushed states to invite everybody and anybody they think would, would be important to this conversation to truly advance um, all emergency communications and not just one specific silo. And then in November, we reconvened all the states to identify um, what, what they accomplished to date, what they still need to accomplish, why they didn't accomplish what they thought they would, and future actions. And through these conversations and meetings, we plan on releasing a report that should be coming out in the next couple of days. And I'll be sure that this report gets disseminated to y'all that identified some lessons learned um, through this Policy Academy that would be uh, applicable to other states. Uh, next slide, please. And before getting into those lessons learned, I want to briefly talk about the states that were involved and some of the things that they accomplished through us. And the states I was mentioned earlier are Alaska, Hawaii, Illinois, Utah, and West Virginia. 
And some of them had similar goals and some had some unique goals. So, for instance, Alaska and Hawaii were very similar in that they wanted to create a governance body, um, whether it be a SIGB or SIC or just a, a, a body that advanced emergency communication goals to the higher levels of state government. And Alaska and Hawaii were two states who did not have any kind of emergency communication body. So Alaska sought to establish their body through administrative order, which we helped draft, and now that is um, at the governor's office, and we're pretty confident that that should hopefully be signed fairly soon. And then Hawaii drafted legislation to legislatively enact uh, SIEC, and that legislation is um, currently being uh, considered in the legis legislature right now. And if, if worse comes to worse, what's going to happen is that if it does not get passed, um, the governor has shown full commitment, and he will sign an executive order to enact it. Um, Illinois' main goal was they want to take all their disparate governance bodies and centralize them into one entity so that they can um, uh, advance their priorities in a coherent manner and make sure that all the voices were um, in just one body to convey priorities to the governor. And one, the first step that was necessary for this was to make sure that the SWIC became a full-time position because before it was just a contract position and there was no um, I guess solidification that it would be the SWIC would be there for the foreseeable future. So they ne they just recently established the SWIC's full-time position, and so that was the first key step. And they have a timeline of um, identifying how to centralize the rest of their bodies. Um, I'm going to skip Utah for now because Gordy's going to talk about their work and what they've done, and I want to repeat anything that y'all will hear, and he'll be able to talk about it far more coherently than I'll be able to. Um, but lastly. I do want to talk about West Virginia, and they created a transition document for the new governor who came in the office this past January. And the transition document, a main goal was to outline the capabilities of the radio network, but more importantly, um, the importance of their SIC, and while it's important to fund the SIC and to approve it. And I'm happy to say that this past Saturday, actually, the legislature legislatively enacted the SIC, which was their main, um, I guess for lack of a better term, pie in the sky goal that they really thought, they really wanted to push it, and they weren't too sure if it would get through, and it did this past weekend. So it was, um, I was really happy for them, and it really showed the importance of, um, you know, getting together all the stakeholders from the state and, and elevating this issue to um, the highest levels. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to touch upon the four lessons learned that we came out of this Boss Academy, and I'm just going to give you the high-level overview just for the sake of time. And by all means, th there's, these are spelled out far more in the paper itself. But first and foremost, we found that it's critical that states maintain a body that provides a form for all officials to utilize, that utilize these tools to ensure that all concerns priorities are addressed and aligned. And we, we saw that if you have disparate bodies, they may advocate for various priorities, which creates confusion for executive decision makers. And we found that unifying these voices together makes sure that everyone's preaching on the same message, which is beneficial to ensuring that um, gaps and uh, misconceptions are, are, are addressed. And that goes into the second recommendation, which is leveraging and messaging the SCIF, which is the statewide uh, communication interoperability plan. And we found that a lot of decision makers and, and policy makers, they don't, they tend to either not fully read the SCIP or not, may not comprehend it. So it's important that these governance bodies strategically think about how they can portray the SCIP in a useful manner so it's not just seen as an IT issue, but more as a public safety issue and an infrastructure issue. And really pushing a message home, whether it's through um, uh, issue briefs, white papers, various presentations, and so on and so forth. And using this message strategy is important then to go and engage the legislature. And we found that it's important that you identify a legislative champion that can push for uh, priorities and legislation if needed with their colleagues. And I can't tell you that there's been more than one encounter that I've had with legislators and other executive decision makers where they're confused about capabilities of emergency communications. And I'll give just one brief example in that one legislator from an undisclosed state, I'll just give you like that, told me that they thought that NG911 was going to be replaced by FirstNet and that they misaligned the two. So that right there is, is huge that if you have these, these um, individuals who hold the purse strings to the state and they have this misconception at the most basic level that the onus really is on these governance bodies to make sure that those misconceptions are addressed. 
And last but not least, we said that it's important that you, you empower and elevate the SWIC and to, in order to coordinate all these activities. And by empowering the SWIC and elevating them um, so that they can have access to the governor's office, that also empowers the 9-1 administrators of the state, as well as the broadband point of contacts or the SPOCs, if that's not the SWIC. Um, and we see that there's value of having someone who's focused uh, every day to think strategically about emergency communications and interoperability of all three of these tools to really um, enhance um, the tools that help public safety officials every day um, help all the citizens in the state. Um, next slide, please. So I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, I'll be more happy to answer any questions. And um, feel free to reach out to me. That's my contact information. And I'll be more than happy to uh, um, answer any questions offline if we can't do any online. Um, so thank you. Okay, well, good day, everybody. I guess you're ready for me now. <laughs> um, happy to be here with you today. My, as I said, my name is Gordon Coles. I'm the Statewide Interoperability Coordinator for Utah. Uh, before I get started, I just wanted to give a, a big thank you to NGA and OEC for uh, holding the Interoperability Policy Academy. It was a really good opportunity for uh, our Utah stakeholders to come together and discuss some of the challenges, and, and not just the challenges, but some of the successes that we have with uh, Utah's emergency communication system. Uh, it was also a really good opportunity to uh, meet some of the other states and network with them and, and to find out what they're doing that's been successful for them. It's a good learning experience for us. So uh, next slide. Um, first, I thought I'd just go into our current state of our public safety communications network. It's a, uh, it's a legacy network. It's pretty old. We've, we've probably 20 plus years old, but it's comprised of over 240 uh, mountaintop sites that are comprised of 800 megahertz uh, uh, trunk radio, 800 conventional, VHF conventional, and a large microwave network. Uh, we have approximately 26,000 users on the system, 160,000 calls per 24 hours. That's the push to talks on the radio system. That's about 5.8 million push to talks a year. Uh, our 911 system takes about 3.5 million calls on an annual basis. Uh, next slide. Um, so the challenges that we talked about when we were in the uh, Policy Academy were uh, the, the biggest thing for us is our aging, micro, our aging uh, communications network, radio and microwave, and finding a sustainable funding source for that uh, to be able to upgrade that. Uh, also, emerging technologies, Michael touched on the fact that a, a lot of our executive leadership had the idea that FirstNet was coming in to replace our LMR network, so we had to uh, work closely with them and, and make them understand that we needed to sustain our LMR network because FirstNet is a long ways out from being able to do mission critical voice. Uh, so that, that was a big challenge for us is educating executive leadership and, and then working to uh, incorporate next gen 911 uh, technologies that are coming in, text to 911, uh, more officers that are going to be wearing video cameras, uh, how we're going to handle and manage all those things. <clears throat> and in, in, on the interoperability front, uh, we have a lot of challenges patching our disparate systems together. The 800 meg trunk system, 800 conventional, VHF conventional, VHF trunk system. Now, the VHF trunk system doesn't belong to the state. We have one county in the center of the state that's put in several VHF trunk sites, and so we have uh, some opportunities there to uh, find new ways to, to be able to communicate with them when the need is to cross-communicate between agencies. One of the big challenges that we have is in, in rural areas, the state users have all moved on to the 800 meg trunk system, and the VHF, or the local users are on the VHF network, and normal day operations, it works pretty well, but when there's an incident, uh, there's difficulties there patching them together. Case in point is we just had a high-speed chase in South Central Utah, and, and they had a hard time talking between the highway patrol and the locals, and the first thing they did was blame the 800 meg radio system for coming into play. Uh, because the presumption there was that because Highway Patrol was on the 800 meg system that they couldn't talk to them, when in reality they still have the VHF network and they still have VHF radios, they could have talked on that. So it's an educational thing, a training thing. We need to teach them to, uh, when they're having an incident like that in these areas where we have both bands, is to use the VHF band because they both have those still. Uh, 
and we also have training issues. We we have a, a, a large number of staff that have, that uh, are their senior staff. They've been on for a long time. So succession planning, uh, dispatcher training, end user training. These are all issues that uh, and challenges that we talked about in the academy. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So our governance model. We have a pretty good governance model. Uh, right now, our board is made up of 27 members, uh, local, state, uh, tribal. We even have a member of the Senate and a member of the House on, on our board. Uh, we talked about that as being a challenge as well because the board is so big, so sometimes it's hard to come to consensus. So one of the things that we talked about was the possibility of reducing the size of the board, uh, which the board members were agreeable on. They felt like it was too large, but none of them really wanted to be the ones that were dismissed. And uh, we, we talked about this with the legislature and, and some action happened. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, next slide. Uh, so in, in our legislation this year, uh, they, they passed a bill, Senate Bill 198, which uh, restructured the board. Uh, it will now be made up of nine members, three, three appointed by the governor, one by the Senate, one by the House, two from the cities of leagues and towns, and two from associations of counties. So it's a nine-member board, and these members will not be users of the system. They will be agnostic from that. And we felt like that that change in governance would allow for a small degree of separation for, between the users of the system and, and the board so that we could have a broader uh, range of uh, knowledge base to come from that. Um, so as part of that, to help the members that are being taken off the board have a voice. They, they're creating a 19-member operations advisory committee, and that will be made up of the police chiefs, the fire chiefs, uh, the EMS folks, uh, PSAPs, public safety, UDOT, all, all those folks that were on, the tribal folks that were on the, the old board will have representation through this 19-member advisory committee. And as part of that, they're creating also seven regional advisory committees so that they, each of the regions can talk about things that are going on in within their region, and each of those seven advisory committees chairs will be part of the 19-member uh, operations advisory committee. So all those uh, ideas and, and, and challenges and things that they have will come up through that to the board, and the board can discuss those and vote on those things. Uh, next slide. Um, our funding model uh, prior to legislation, uh, we, we charge a user fee for each user that uses the system. So every radio that's on the network pays a user fee, whether it's an 800 trunk radio or a VHF radio. Um, and that money equated to about between six and seven million a year, and that's what we use for operation and maintenance of the system. But it was nowhere near enough money to, uh, to fund the upgrade of our network, and our network was installed prior to the Winter Olympics that were here in 2002, so back in, 98, 99, that's when the 800 trunk system was installed, the VHF system even older than that, and the microwave system older than that. So we're over 20 years. And the price tag to upgrade that is we're, we're estimating around $140 million. So the user fees just won't cover that. Next slide. So this legislation, they were, uh, uh, through our discussions with the Policy Academy and, and, and uh, articulating our needs to them, that in the bill that they passed, the Senate Bill 198, they, they rescinded the user fee. So UCA will no longer collect a user fee per radio device, which will come at a cost savings to the, to the local government agencies of about $4 million a year and to the state agencies about $3.2 million. They'll no longer have to pull that from their tax basis to pay for the radios. The new legislation uh, provides for an ongoing funding of the operation, uh, for operation and maintenance and for the upgrade now, through uh, an increase in the 911 fee that's charged. So currently they're charging nine, or 76 cents per device that can dial 911. That's going to be increased in, on July 1 to 98 cents, and 18 cents of that will come to UCA to replace the user fee. So that'll equate to about the seven million that we had for user fees. Uh, in January of 2018, the fee will increase by another 34 cents to $1.32 per device. And that will equate to about $12 million a year, which we'll use as a, to pay for a bond to, to uh, fund the $140 million upgrade. So these things, this, this legislative session, we're able to take care of the, uh, some of the governance needs and, and kind of streamline our governance model. It really was a good functioning governance model, but it needed to be streamlined, and we were able to get that done. And then we've 
uh, got the needed revenues that we're uh, to, to get our system upgraded and get it up to date. Uh, we still have a lot of challenges. Uh, some of the other things that we talked about there with interoperability, a uh, lot, lot of other things that we still need to work on. But uh, we made some good progress this year, and uh, we can thank some of our uh, discussions in the, from the Policy Academy for helping us to get there. And that's all I have. Okay, sorry. You caught me off guard. You were too fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, that's quite all right. All right, um, really quickly, I want to thank both um, Mr. Cole and Mr. Garcia, but I also want to state before we start the question period, um, Mr. Garcia had referenced a skip and a switch. And for those of you on the call who may not be familiar with those terms, SCIP is the Statewide Communications Interoperability Plan, and this is a plan that everybody, um, every state in the U.S. has. And then the SWIC is the Statewide Interoperability Coordinator. And again, there is one of those designated for at least every state. So with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. As a reminder, you can either enter your question via the chat function or raise your hand and we will unmute your line. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you for providing that clarification. We did have a couple questions on that. Um, our next question, how can the 911 community best benefit from the 911 Policy Academy? All right, so this is, I'll take a stab at that. This is Michael. Um, so I think what we would say is that the 911 community should make sure they reach out to their SWICs. And I think I've, I've pressed that with my SWICs that um, for those teams that I mentioned there was a core team, um, a lot of the states didn't send a 911 administrator. And so I brought that up and said, you guys need to make sure that you have your state 911 administrators and your also your, your local 911 administrators in the room when you talk about these issues. So I think the most concrete step I'll take is, is saying that. Um, but also, as far as NGA, we are going to work, especially when my issue brief is actually published, I plan on reaching out to Nina, NASNA, obviously DOT, and the other um, 911 associations to see how, on a national scale, how we can work together in the future um, to really keep driving this home. Because this, is, this isn't the end, it's only the beginning. So um, those are two fronts that, you know, I'm pushing and hopefully um, I should get some good reciprocity. Uh, coordination with the other uh, associations on that front. Thank you. Our next question is, could the Utah fee be used for 911 or just radio? Uh, the fee is actually, it's structured for 911 and radio. So the, out of the, uh, the, the fee that's being charged, the 98 cents, 71 cents of that goes to the dispatch centers. And they're, they're uh, distributing that on a call base. It used to be done on a subscription basis, and now they've changed it to a call basis so that it's a fair distribution between the larger and the smaller dispatch centers. So 71 cents of that 98 cents goes directly to the, to the PSAPs. Thank you. Our next question asks, how will priorities for funding upgraded be made? Could you repeat that, please? How will priorities for funding and upgrades be made? So we've developed a strategic plan that was given to the legislature as we requested this funding. And now this, this plan was developed through cooperation of all the stakeholders through our board. Uh, and going forward now, we're going to develop an RFP and go out to bid for the new system. Uh, we... Uh, Right now, it's, it's going to be to upgrade the existing system. So anything that's old 800 meg trunked and old VHF conventional through this, uh, through this uh, process will be replaced and upgraded to newer technology. The 800 is going to go to a P25 system. Uh, the VHF radios are capable of P25, but uh, we're not using that right now because of uh, the, the impact on the end user. Uh, we'll gradually move towards that as time goes on. Uh, and then as we, uh, as this 19-member uh, interoperability committee, this advisory committee meets, we will hear from each of those seven regions through this 19-member committee 
the needs in those areas and where we may need to build out, uh, where more coverage may be needed, uh, those kind of things. That, that's how we'll address those things and we'll prioritize those as we go. Thank you. The next question is directed towards Mr. Coles. Can you please describe the process of securing bond funding to advance emergency communications and operability? So we, we used to have, uh, but prior to this House or Senate Bill 198, we had the ability to bond on our own. Uh, that was taken away from us in this session. Um, the, the state would prefer that we use their bonding authority because they, they have a AAA bonding uh, power, which would save quite a bit of money because they can get a better interest rate. So we'll be presenting this uh, through our strategic plan. We'll be requesting to the state to, to go out to bond for whatever comes through this RFP. We don't have that information at this moment, but uh, once we get that process done and an RFP is awarded, then we'll go and, and uh, request the bond through the state of Utah. Thank you. Our next question asks, are all states governors members of NGA? Hi. Um, so I believe over 45 are. Um, so how NGA is structured is that we have due-paying member states. Um, so not all um, state members are, but most, most of them are. But you can go to our website, nga.org, to see if your state is a member or not. But also feel free to reach out to me offline. I can help you out. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you to both Mr. Garcia and Mr. Cole. And Lori, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Um, I will let you introduce our second set of speakers. Thank you very much. So our second set of speakers are Ms. Evelyn Bailey, who's the Executive Director of the National Association of State 911 Administrators, or NASNA, and Ms. Randy Jones, who's the 911 Coordinator for the State of Arkansas. And they're going to be talking about use of data. Um, and just to give you one minute of background, and I'm sure Evelyn will talk about this as well, we have been working with NASNA and, uh, and our contractors um, collecting consistent uniform data from the states, a very small data set, but still very important data set since about 2011. Um, and the folks at NASNA have figured prominently in this project from the very beginning. Um, and we are now at the stage where the data are being utilized, and I think that's what they're going to talk about. Um, I've known Evelyn for a million years, uh, give or take. Um, she was the state coordinator in Vermont. She has a variety of experiences both at the state and the national level. Um, and her perspective on a variety of issues has always been very valuable to me. And we're really lucky to have Randy Jones with us also from the state of Arkansas, and I do appreciate, ladies, both of your time, and the floor is yours. Very good. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Evelyn Bailey. I'll lead us off. Um, in addition to, to what Lori mentioned, uh, I just wanted to add that NASNA is a nonprofit association made up of state 911 administrators. By definition, there will not be very many uh, of us, so it's a relatively small organization made up of those leaders. And the organization provides a variety of services to its members, but we also serve as an information resource and provide subject matter expertise on state 911 issues to a variety of, of stakeholders, including federal government agencies, uh, national associations and organizations, as well as local organizations. So um, we have uh, an internal aspect as well as an external aspect. And as Lori mentioned also, we have been involved in the National 911 Profile Database process for quite a long time. So I would like to go to the next slide, please. Very good. So uh, the National 911 Profile Database is a program of the National 911 Office in NHTSA. And it began back in 2007-2008, where uh, we worked with uh, NHTSA to identify data elements that would be feasible to collect and also useful 
to uh, to anybody that wanted to have a national perspective on what's going on with 911. So it was important that the data be consistent, be uniform, and a small set of data elements was developed from that early engagement. So it got off the ground a few years later with the first data collection, and we've now had a few years under our belts. And this is really wonderful because it enables a perspective on how things are changing over time, something that wasn't possible to do earlier on. But now you can see what's happened not only in um, the year that just passed, but also what the trends are over time, which makes the information particularly useful. So the states will collect data often from, uh, from their local 911 centers and aggregate it at the state level and report it up uh, to the national level through this database. And data are provided not only by NASDA members, but also non-member states and territories. The types of data collected fall into two categories, base, what we call baseline data elements and progress benchmarks. And if you'd go to the next slide, I'll get a little bit deeper into what those categories look like. So the baseline data elements include things such as 911 call volumes by call type, the number of state and sub-state 911 authorities that exist, the level of service, that is to say whether people have basic 911 or enhanced 911 or wireless phase one or wireless phase two, whether they've incorporated voice over IP. Uh, so the level of service that exists is sorted by population and by geography. And that baseline data element also includes the number of primary and secondary PSAPs that exist in a state. The next category are the progress benchmarks. And that includes things such as, um, is there a statewide 911 plan? Are there sub-state 911 plans that are required? It tracks uh, procurement of NG911 system components, such as, um, is there, has there been a procurement? Is a contract awarded? Has installation and testing occurred? And are, um, is, uh, is there, is any of that operational, basically? Um, so where, where are they in terms of particularly next generation 911? So um, this is the type of information that's collected in this report. And if you'll go to the next slide, the big question really is why support this data collection? Because it really does take some effort not all systems are sophisticated and can automate some of this information. So it does require effort, but it's really worth that effort. And it's worth it because it will benefit not only the states, but also their local stakeholders. And as we go through the presentation, you'll see exactly how this can be beneficial. Um, states use the data to answer questions from their legislators, their policy makers about how their state compares with other states. For those of you out there in the audience who are um, in uh, the public sector, whether it's at the local level, level or the state level, you know what I mean. People want to know um, how you compare with your neighbors. So this is a wonderful way to be able to, pro to get empirical information that enables that comparison. The information that's contained in the report can also provide states with enhanced credibility and visibility in their states to be able to have information that can be shared with policymakers, elected officials, and other stakeholders makes the 911 um, program or the the entity and state government that's handling the data collection, if it's not an official state level 911 program, um, to be the go-to person for information is a very good thing for the program. It 
enables you to demonstrate the value of your program. Uh, occasionally, somebody will say, well, why do we need a state level 911 program? Uh, for those that are, are uneducated about 911, the information from this report enables you to demonstrate the value of your program. And it also can help you make the case uh, for additional funding for legislative changes, for other things that are necessary to support state and local operations, especially in this time of transition where we're uh, leaving the legacy systems be behind and uh, transitioning toward next generation 911. So these are um, wonderful ways that the information can be used, and you can't put a price tag on how valuable being able to do these things is. So next slide, please. I'm going to get in now into how states actually use the information in the annual profile report. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it really is a good way for a state to see how they're doing in comparison with other states. And they can look at that other state in terms of the states immediately around them, which is often of particular interest, but also states that are similar to them, perhaps in, in demographics, in population, uh, in the number of 911 calls, whatever it, it might be. Um, they can compare themselves with other states in a variety of different ways and um, just have a better sense of where they are in the grand scheme of things. It also helps a state 911 program to better understand what's occurring at the local level. And by having a better understanding of that, they have a better understanding of what the needs are at the local level. Some of the states already have been collecting data from, uh, from local 911 authorities, and they have used the annual profile uh, data gathering initiative to augment what they already collect with some additional information. And they found that this improves their ability to, uh, to have meaningful information that, uh, that they can use to support their local governments in improving 911 services. They include it in their annual reports to their governors and legislatures if they're required to produce such reports every year. And uh, they also can use it to remind uh, their elected officials what is actually spent on 911. And it may be a good thing or it may be a bad thing, but um, how, how their state is in terms of what's spent on 911 compared to neighboring states or other similar states. Uh, so legislators find this information valuable, and it's valuable to a state 911 program to be able to provide that information. Um, all of this enables, uh, enables them to tell a more complete story because they're drilling down at, uh, to a very detailed level to capture and report information. And, um, with regard to uh, the fifth bullet, the, the last item, there is a bill right now in the state of Iowa that is tasking them to produce a request for information to bring landline into their statewide next generation 911 system. Uh, their ESINET currently only supports wireless. So from this data collection, they were able to show the legislature what they're paying for two networks, the landline 911 system and the statewide ESINET for wireless, and to point out what they could see as to what, uh, what, the, costs, what the cost savings would be. So they found this information very helpful in their transition to make the case um, to to further progress toward next generation 911 and in, in incorporating all of the different types of communication technologies into their ESINET. Next slide, please. So this is the continuation. Uh, they use the information to answer questions. 
as I mentioned earlier, questions from their legislators, their 911 advisory boards, their PSAPs. Um, they use it to provide a national perspective on things such as text to 911, and uh, in particular, in order to to help motivate their 911 centers to support it. And uh, another. Uh, case in point is the state of Illinois. Illinois used it um, with their PSAPs because after the data gathering uh, for one of the most recent reports, they found out that only 15% of their PSAPs have implemented text 911. So they were able to make the case for more implementations, showing that Illinois is behind its neighbors in implementing text 911. And they also um, understanding why in their state it's not being implemented as widely as they would like it to be is because the counties are, um, many of them, very rural. They have no money. And so that enabled the state to uh, to say, okay, we're, we understand this is hard for you. We're going to, to roll this out on a statewide basis, and they understand uh, that they will get more local support by doing it that way. And in addition, um, they also were able to identify that there were 13 counties in their state that still were not doing E911 um, when the, the very uh, first state 911 administrator came on a couple of years ago. So 13 counties that did not have enhanced 911. So this enabled them to prioritize getting the unserved served by providing funding and other support to help bring them, uh, bring them up to speed. Next slide, please. So this is a, um, a slide that I borrowed from Lori Flaherty. The information in the report is, is in tabular form. Uh, many of them, many of the tables can be put into a spreadsheet and mixed um, and sorted in a variety of ways. And uh, this one is particularly interesting. Let's just say that you wanted to, uh, uh, that you were the state of Colorado, and you wanted to see what other states receive a similar number of 911 calls. And if you look above and below, called the line with Colorado, you'll see that they're very similar to the state of Washington and the state of Arizona. So that may be useful information. And similarly with, uh, let's just pick on Indiana, um, Indiana is very much like Virginia and Maryland in terms of their call volumes. So this may be useful information for them. And if you go to the next slide, um, another slide, thanks to Lori, where call volume by type is displayed. So the red is wireline. Um, where is my little thing here? Yes. Uh, no, the red is 2014 and the blue is 2015. So it shows wireline, cellular, VoIP, multi-line telephone systems, and text to 911. Uh, for each of those years, and you can see uh, you can see uh, wireline call volumes going down, and you can see uh, wireless call volumes leaping toward toward the sky. So this is all useful information that can be shared with people and um, and used in a variety of ways to help make progress in the state. At this point, I am through. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Randy, from Arkansas, where we're going to drill down as a case study as to how she uses the information in her state. So Randy, you're on. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, next slide, please. So good morning, everyone, or afternoon. Thank you for giving me a few minutes to share with you this afternoon. It is an absolute privilege to offer support for the National 911 Profile Database. I myself greatly appreciate this resource and the work that goes into the data collection each year. Um, let's go ahead and advance our slides. 
I would like to take a few minutes to reiterate Evelyn's previous slides. Like many states, Arkansas has utilized this tool on numerous occasions. For myself, this report has served as an introduction to the 911 industry. It has helped me gain the knowledge to understand the many issues facing our PSATs and helped me understand the kinds of questions that I should be asking. This report has helped me to provide answers and build relationships with our local coordinators and our telecommunicators. It has also served as an aid for me when giving presentations. And as Evelyn mentioned earlier, uh, this, this has just been a tool to build a, a rapport with our locals. When they have a question, I can point them to this report, to this database, to give them answers. It has been an absolute godsend in helping me to educate our elected officials. It has also helped not just educate our elected officials, but our new 911 coordinators at the local level. It's giving them a place to go to start their education journey. I've used this report to start training and operational conversations at the local PSAP level, and we are relying heavily on this report for our planning towards next generation here in Arkansas. Next slide, please. So Arkansas every year collects um, a, certifica a certification form from each of our PSAPs. In recent years, we have greatly increased the amount of information that we are collecting to better align it with this report and the FCC's report. I will say, you know, when you uh, record, uh, increase a survey from three or four pages up to 13 or 14, you do get a little pushback, but as soon as our locals really understood why we were asking for this data and how it was being used, they've been, they've been more than cooperative and, and eager to help us. Um, our Association of Counties here gets, uh, gets a copy of this report every year when it comes out to help them understand more not just what's facing Arkansas, but what's facing the nation as we work to transition into these IP networks. And I have also been using it to, to help me emphasize the fact that not just Arkansas, but each state needs some form, some single point of contact at the state level for 911. And it's just, it's helped me to keep 911 in the spotlight here in our state. And Evelyn, that, that's really kind of what's been going on in, in our state, in Arkansas. Very good. Thank you, Randy. That wraps us up, and we're happy to take any questions. If you could go to the next slide, that has our, our contact information. Uh, if you uh, aren't able to get your question to us before our time runs out today, you are more than welcome to email or phone us directly. Okay. Thank you, Av and Randy. Um, that was very informative. And once again, we will open up the QA part of our session, and I'll just remind you that you can either enter your question via the chat function or use the raise hand button. Our first question is inquiring how long did it take to complete the survey? Um, I want to say, and this is probably more of a question for Lori, the, the, it starts on a month certain. So this year, for example, it just started at the beginning of April. And I believe that a couple of months are given to the data collection. And then there's a lot of work to, uh, to analyze it, to get it into a report. And there's a great deal of follow-up with the states as well and with some of the territories, and that may take a little while. The report typically comes out at the end of the year, end of the calendar year. So it's quite some months from beginning to end. But the data collection piece of it is only a couple of months long. Lori, am I right? No, that is correct, and I'll just add um, that after the data are aggregated uh, from the from the NHTSA collection point, we also, for a limited number of data elements, combine data sets with NINA because they collect information from their state chapters with regard to their progress in implementing next generation 911. And so um, while neither database is complete in terms of all 56 states and territories, um, we're usually able to add a few by combining data with, with NINA. So 
both of those reports are available on, on 911.gov. Thank you. Our next question, are there planned changes to the questions being asked in the survey? Yes, there are. Um, I don't think anything has been written in stone yet, but there is a core group of state 911 administrators and others who are reviewing the questions, m many of which have been around now for a number of years, to see whether they still need to be collected, or whether we've, we've gotten past it um, in terms of the usefulness of the information, and also whether uh, there's additional information that that probably should be collected because we all keep getting questions about um, about certain things over and over again, and it might be useful just to incorporate those into um, into the profile database questionnaire. There's also uh, the fact that now that we are having an increasing number of next generation 911 uh, transitions happening, everybody's approaching it. Uh, in phases, it seems nobody is, um, is, or very few are doing it. Um, let's just say the the EZNet and the next generation 911 core functions all at once. A few are, but most aren't. So being able to get a better handle on the transitional process and where people are um, with those large functional elements is uh, something that we've learned is important and that will um, may lead to some refinement of the profile database, uh, the questions that are asked. But that is, uh, nothing is final yet, but those discussions are happening. Our next question is a two-part two question. Doesn't the FCC have their own annual survey? And if so, what is being done to coordinate both efforts? Yes, the FCC does have its own survey. And a great deal has been done to coordinate those efforts um, so, that, so that nobody has to provide the information twice. So uh, Lori's office, and Lori can speak to this, uh, also has has an arrangement with the FCC to coordinate the timing of the data collection, and what the uh, what the state 911 administrators have started to do is to where those questions are the same question that's fine it only needs to be asked once where the questions between the FCC and the profile database might differ in some regard then those get added to to what's requested what the state uh, requests, and um, and then it basically what the state has to do is just do one data collection and then parse it out to the two, di two different places the data needs to go. And uh, where there's a duplication, uh, effort has been made to eliminate the duplication. Lori, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I mean, that was perfect. Thank you. <laughs> all right, and this is Sherry. I want to thank once again all of our speakers today, Mr. Garcia, Mr. Cole, Ms. Bailey, and Ms. Jones, and ask if Lori has any closing remarks. Well, I'd like to add my thanks to Michael Gordon, Evelyn, and also to Randy. I really appreciate the benefit of your expertise and your experience, and thank you very much for participating in the webinar. Right. It was our pleasure. So this, this concludes today's webinar. We appreciate everyone's participation, and an archived version of today's webinar will be available on 911.gov soon. The next webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, June 13th at noon Eastern Time. A complete listing of the 2017 webinar dates is provided, along with a link to register for all of these. This year, you're able to register for all 2017 webinar dates at one time. Simply go to the webpage and click on the check box in the upper left-hand corner, and this will um, register you 
for all of the 2017 webinars. We hope you'll be able to join us and thank you and have a great day.